there was a, a boy in Karen's class one time. Karen was, this is several years ago, Karen was, was just substitute teaching at the time. It wasn't too long after we had been moved here. And so she was substitute teaching, and she was in one of the classes at the middle school. And there was a boy there who was just causing problems. And she said to him, she goes, something along the line, you know, you should know better than that. He goes, don't you know who I am? And she said, no. And he said, and he told her who he was. And she goes, and he goes, I'm supposed to be bad. Okay. Don't you that. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know, some of us see ourselves in that type of life. We see ourselves always in the negative. We see ourselves, you know, anything negative about ourselves, that's what we tend to dwell on. Um, several years ago, or a few years ago, there was a, a, an ad by Dove, and some of you may have seen this before, but I want to show it because I think it's really uh, insightful and it helps us see some. So, Amy, would you go ahead and play that? I'm a forensic artist. Worked for the San Jose Police Department from 1995 to 2011. I showed up to a place I'd never been, and there was a guy with a drafting board. We couldn't see them, they couldn't see us. Tell me about your hair. I didn't know what he was doing, but then I could tell after several questions that he was drawing me. Tell me about your chin. It kind of protrudes a little bit, hmm. especially when I smile. Your jaw? My mom told me I had a big jaw. What would be your most prominent feature? Kind of have a fat rounder face. The older I've gotten, the more freckles I've gotten. I'd say I have a pretty big forehead. Once I get a sketch, I say thank you very much, and then they leave. I don't see them. All I had been told before the sketch was to get friendly with this other woman, Chloe. Today I'm going to ask you some questions about a uh, person you met earlier, and I'm going to ask you some general questions about their face. She was thin, so you could see her cheekbones. And her chin, it was a nice, thin chin. She had nice eyes. They lit up when she spoke. She had, nice. she had blue eyes, very nice blue eyes. This is the sketch that you helped me create, and that's a sketch that somebody described of you. See how this? They looked at themselves and they knew all their flaws. And so they were looking at that. And in our scripture today, we kind of read something similar. Isaiah is brought into the very presence of God. And I think his reaction would be just like ours. And so let's read what he says. This is in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. We're going to read it. And this is what it says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs. 
each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, with a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth, and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. See, Isaiah's reaction was appropriate for anyone who would come into the presence of God by themselves. If we would go and stand in God's presence, stand before His throne, I think we would have the same thoughts, the same worries that Isaiah had. That we are people with unclean lips. And that's just a euphemism for basically saying that I'm a sinner. And I live among the people who are sinners. The scripture is very clear that we are all sinners. It's very clear about that. None of us can measure up to God's holiness. And I think coming for God's throne would make any of us dread, dreadfully aware of our failures. We'd realize that our hidden sins couldn't be hidden any longer. Karen and I have been watching a documentary called The Staircase. It's about a novelist by the name of Michael Peterson who back in... I can't remember what year it was, back in the early, late 1900s or early uh, the 1990s or the early 2000s, uh, his wife was found at the bottom of the staircase. And they decided that he had committed a murder. And, uh, you know, we, we've been watching, I'm not sure whether he did or not. I mean, I'm kind of confused a little bit. But what was interesting is while they were going, looking into the case and investigating it, they found out the man had a secret side. He was bisexual, and he had contacted male prostitutes through the internet. And they found this out, and they, that's what they thought might be the motive that his wife had found out what was going on, even though he said she knew. But the thing that was interesting about it is that people who had loved this man, who were standing beside this man, when they heard that, their whole idea of him changed. People who didn't think that he was guilty, the daughter of his wife from a previous marriage, She'd been standing by him, and when she found out about that, guess what? Now she thought he had killed her mother because of what was going on. People's view had changed. And you know, that's why we keep our sins hidden, isn't it? You know, we are more often afraid of what other people are going to think. We're afraid of what other people in the world are going to think than we are about God. But you know, He already knows what's going on in our life. We might think that our sins are hidden pretty well, that nobody knows about them, but guess what? They know. God knows. We can't hide them. In Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4, and this is from uh, the easy to read version, it says this, Lord, you have tested me, so you know all about me. You know when I sit down and when I get up. You know my thoughts from far away. You know where I go and where I lie down. You know everything I do. Lord, you know what I want to say even before the words leave my mouth. <laughs> That's kind of scary, isn't it? To know that God knows everything about us. He knows every place that we go. He even knows the words that we're going to say before we say them. We can't hide our sins, folks. God knows them. When we stand before His throne... We need to say, woe is me, if we're trying to get there on our own goodness. Because God knows all that is going on. But here's the good news that we need to be reminded of. <clears throat> you see, through Christ, our sins have been forgiven. 
You see what happened here to Isaiah? He says, you know, I'm a, a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. I'm a sinner among a bunch of sinners. That's where we are at. But notice what happens. Look at verse 6 and 7 again. It says this. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a light coal in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Your sin atoned for. See, Isaiah's guilt was taken away and he no longer had to pay the penalty for his sins. They've been atoned for. Atonement has the idea of making things right between two parties. And in this case, between God and us. Romans 3, 23-25 says this. And this is from New International. It says, For all sin to fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. You get that, he says? God was in the crisis a sacrifice of atonement. In other words, to make things right between us and God, Jesus died on the cross. The New, New Living Translation trans translates the verse this way. It says, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus, when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sins. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Why God says that, that God made us right with him in <coughs> Jesus' sacrifice. Second Corinthians 5.21 even goes farther. And it says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. God makes us righteous through His Son, Jesus Christ. Because what Christ did on the cross, that makes us righteous in God's sight. One of my favorite passages is found in 1 Corinthians 6. And what it does there, there's several verses where Paul describes several sinful types of people. And he says these people will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But I love what 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says. It says, and that is what some of you were. You get that? Some of you were. Past tense. It's no longer true of you. It says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. Get that? There were people in the church in Corinth who had been living sinful lives. Matter of fact, it was every single one of them. And they were no longer that way. Why? Because they put their faith and their trust in Christ. And it says that God washed them. He sanctified them. That means make them holy, pure. And they were justified because of what Christ Jesus had done and by the Holy Spirit coming into their life. You know, many of us, we continue to struggle with sin in our lives. You know, I don't know how many of you, I still do. I still struggle with that. And we keep trying to stop, but we keep doing it. And you have a problem with something? You know, there's a sin or two that's in your life that, that you know you need to stop. Did you need to quit? But you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it? Well, this week I was reading an article. And I went to find it later on in the week. And I couldn't find it any longer. But the basic point of the article was this. That the reason we can't stop sinning with those pet sins, those sins that just seem to, we just keep falling into again and again, the reason we can't stop them is because we are focusing on the sin. And what he said we need to do is instead to focus on Jesus. Our goal shouldn't be not to sin, but to live for Jesus. Get the difference there? We are so busy trying to stop sinning that we forget the real source of our power to overcome it. And that is Jesus. We're trying to do it by ourselves. 
on our own. I've got to stop doing this. I've got to stop doing this. And what's always the problem with that? The word I. Because we know we can't. It's only through God's power, through the Holy Spirit in us, that we can overcome it. You all know I, I coach football. And I coach the offensive line. And uh, sometimes they have a real problem. Uh, trying to block. And the reason is, is because they don't do what I tell them. <laughs> but what the problem is, is that they are trying to keep the defensive man across from them out of the backfield. They're trying to keep him from getting past them. All right? And so they're very passive about it. So basically, they're a matter of fact, they will just stand up pretty much and just kind of try to keep that person back. And what happens is that, that other guy takes off across there, he moves through, guess what? He gets right past them. Because they're trying just to catch that person and stop them from coming through. And what I try to teach them is that in order for them to block well, it's not to stop that guy from getting through the line, but to drive that guy off of the line. To go forward, to move him forward out of the way so that they, the ball carrier can get through the hole. Then. You don't just wait for them. You drive them out. You see, it's kind of the same thing with us. We try to stop sin from coming at us instead of going forward and letting Christ do what we're supposed to. You know, so many of us are like that, those women in the video. We focus on our failures. And we constantly see ourselves as sinners. But according to what the Scripture says, that's what we were. God says we are forgiven, that we are born again, that we are His children. That's what we need to be focusing on. Yeah, I, I do believe that we are all sinners. But I also believe that, that is, God is dealing with that in our lives. If we will just focus on Him, if we'll realize that we're forgiven, if we'll realize that we have been born, we've been changed through what Christ is doing in us, through His Spirit, that we are God's children. I think it will change the way that we go through our lives. And sin will become less and less a problem for us. We need to start believing what God says. Because he says we are able to overcome that. I'm going to play a song for you. And uh, I want you to listen to the words of this very closely. They're going to be on there. But I want you to pay attention to this. Because I think this is an important song for you to hear. Okay, go ahead and play that for
took care of that. And we need to believe you, Father, when you say that we are your children, that you love us, that we are strong enough to do the things you call us to do. So help us to, to realize that and be willing to, to do whatever you ask us to, to realize that we have the strength to do it, not because we are doing it ourselves, but because you are enabling us. So may we listen to you, Father, to what you have to say to us. And may we believe it with all of our heart. And may it change the way that we live our lives. May we live, with Father, to, to honor you, to serve you, to live in because we are your children. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.